Manganese dioxide is a blackish or brown solid with several different uses. It is commonly used in organic chemistry as something known as an oxidant, and it can also be used as a pigment. However, the main use of manganese dioxide is actually in dry cell batteries. It's called a dry cell battery because it doesn't have any liquid in it, and instead it uses a paste. Anyway, that's not too important, but one of the most common versions of these dry cell batteries is known as the zinc carbon battery. This battery compared to others is extremely cheap to produce, and this is the type of battery that you'll most commonly find in things like dollar stores. I'm not really going to get into the details about how these batteries work, but basically they're called zinc carbon batteries, but they contain a lot of manganese dioxide. The metal can of the battery is made out of zinc, there's a carbon rod in the center, and in between the can and the rod is manganese dioxide. Maybe in the future I'll do a video on how batteries work, but for now that's out of the scope of this one. Anyway, these batteries are a very easy source of manganese dioxide, a carbon electrode, and zinc metal. My main target is the manganese dioxide itself, but I'm also going to keep the zinc and the carbon just in case I need it in the future. My goal is to use the manganese dioxide in another over-the-counter synthesis of bromine. By heating a mixture of manganese dioxide, sodium bromide, and sulfuric acid, we can generate bromine. I've already carried this out and it turned out to be an extremely dirty process and the first method that I posted is a lot better, but I still thought it was interesting to explore. This will be posted in a later video because I did film it in 4K and I want to get all of my videos that I filmed in 1080p out first. So to start off, I bought five packs of D-cell batteries from the dollar store. These are pretty cheap and I decided to do a lot at once because the process is pretty dirty and I didn't really want to do it again. Also, D-cell batteries are the best ones to get because they're the biggest, which means that you have to open fewer batteries to get more. If you had to do this process with double A's or triple A's, I would just really feel bad for you. So for the first and somewhat obvious step, we need to take the batteries out of the packaging. So I do this pretty quickly and then I just dump them all together on the table. The next thing we do is we target the victim that will be sacrificed first. The opening of the battery takes a little bit of technique and you need a screwdriver. It might be hard to see, but there's actually a crease where the outer casing of the battery comes together. It kind of folds together in a weird way, and you need to use a screwdriver to separate it. The first time you try it, it might look like this, and it's hard to separate, you apply some force, and it still doesn't come apart. If this happens, it means you're not using a good technique. Here is a shot of where a better technique is used, and you'll see the big difference. It might not be the case for you, but for me, the ends of the outer casing were crimped together in such a way that one was kind of slid in under the other. So instead of forcing things, you need to push with the screwdriver and unslip one from the other. This really doesn't take much force, and once this is done, the battery casing comes off pretty easily. This battery casing is kind of useless, and I just tossed it in the garbage. So now we have our inner shell of the battery, and the first thing to do is remove this plastic casing. The plastic casing simply served to separate the zinc from the outer shell of the battery. Once the plastic casing comes off, a couple other pieces fall off, and these are also garbage. At the top, you can see the carbon electrode, and the first thing we do is we tear off this plastic piece. When we look inside, there's a little piece of cardboard, and I removed this using a screwdriver. Once it's removed, underneath we can see the manganese dioxide. Now for the fun part of removing the manganese dioxide, and to do this, I dug it out using a screwdriver. At first I thought this was the best method, but it proved to be pretty messy and pretty annoying. There's actually cardboard between the manganese dioxide and the shell of the battery, and it's important not to pull this with the screwdriver, otherwise you'll mix it in with your manganese dioxide. After doing this, I thought that there must be a better method because this one frankly really sucked. I found that the better method was actually using a pair of pliers and immediately pulling out the carbon electrode. Once the electrode was removed, we had a lot more leverage with the screwdriver and everything came out much quicker. So you can see in this shot, I'm not digging and I jam the screwdriver in the bottom and then I can pull out a lot of manganese dioxide at once. 
I only need to do this two or three times until almost all of the manganese dioxide was removed. Doing it this way also damaged the paper less and therefore there was less paper contamination. So this is what all the manganese dioxide at the end looked like with all the carbon electrodes on the right and all the empty zinc cans on the left. To wash the cans and the electrodes, I simply put them in a bucket of water and shook it a lot. I had to empty the water every time, refill it, and do several rinsings, but once it was done, they were all fairly clean. Although they were no longer completely covered with manganese dioxide, they all still had a little bit on it. At the time, I didn't really have an amazing way to clean it, but I figured when the time came that I wanted to use these in something, I would clean them better. So I left all of the zinc and the carbon rods out to dry, and then I put them away. So now to deal with our manganese dioxide. Mixed in with our manganese dioxide is a little bit of electrolyte, and we need to wash this away with water. So to do this, I started by adding a bunch of distilled water. Then using a glass stir rod, I started to mix it around. However, after mixing it just for several seconds, I realized it was way too thick to act as a real washing. I kept trying to add water in hopes that it would liquefy more, but this was a dead dream. I knew at that point that I had to move on and use a larger container. I cut open the water jug that I used earlier to clean the zinc and the carbon, and I poured in all of my manganese dioxide. It might be a little hard to see in this shot, but at the bottom there was still a lot of thick manganese dioxide. To do a proper washing, we're going to have to have a lot more water. I washed the beaker a few times with water to get out as much manganese dioxide as possible, and then I put the beaker aside. I then added a little bit more of distilled water and mixed it. Our goal here is to have a really liquidy slurry where almost all of the manganese dioxide is floating around in suspension. This way, it all gets washed and then we can simply just leave it and let the manganese dioxide separate to the bottom. Even after adding more water, it was still pretty thick, so I added more water, and it's black because I used that water to rinse the beaker that we used earlier. Once a lot of the manganese dioxide has settled, we should be left with a fairly thick water layer on top, which we can decant, and then we can refill it with more water. The washing steps here are honestly not going to be amazing, and there's still going to be a little electrolyte left over. Anyway, it was watery enough now, and I let it sit out for almost a day. It's really hard to see, but at the top, there's actually a thick water layer. As I pour it, you can see that the liquid going into the beaker is actually clear. The black color of the solution is actually due to the manganese dioxide that was left over in the beaker. This solution at the top doesn't really have much manganese dioxide, and we discard it. If you want to do another washing step, you can add more water, stir it up, and let it separate again. For me personally, I only used one because I didn't care too much about the purity. So, as I said before, we don't need this solution anymore and we can discard it. For this step, I opted to vacuum filter off the remains at the bottom. I only did this because the volume I had to take off was very small. If I vacuum filter it immediately without allowing the manganese dioxide to separate from the water, the filtering step would have taken a very long time. You don't need to vacuum filter it though, you could in theory just pour it into a large tray and let it air dry. I was a little bit pressed for time though because I wanted to do the bromine synthesis the following day, so this was at night and I want to get it done before I went to sleep. After the water's gone, I keep the vacuum pulled on it to get it as dry as possible. Once this is done, I transferred it to a crystallizing dish. You can see that it's pretty pasty and definitely not dry, and to fix this, I'm going to dry it in an oven. You might notice that the bottom of my crystallizing dish looks pretty dirty, but it's actually okay. I'm not really sure what it is, but strong base bath, piranha solution, and acid washes don't get rid of it. I continued to filter the rest of the solution that remained in the bucket, and then I also transferred that to the crystallizing dish. Once it was all transferred, I was left with a nice amount of black paste. So as I said, the next step is to put it into an oven. Once it had dried in the oven for a little while, you can see the big difference. We're left with a nice clumpy mixture of manganese dioxide. 
If you want, you could break up these clumps and powderize them, but I honestly didn't really care. So the next thing that I did was I transferred it to a container for storage. The recovery of manganese dioxide from the batteries was about 290 grams. I think I can assume that I probably lost something like a gram per battery, so this means that each battery probably contained about 30 grams of manganese dioxide. That's all I have to say about manganese dioxide, and in the future you will see me use it to make bromine. For the zinc, I'll probably find some use for it as a catalyst or whether I convert it to something like zinc chloride, but for the carbon electrodes, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do with those. As usual, that's all I have for now, and I hope to see you on the next one. Again, here's a list of the videos that I'm currently editing and future videos I plan to film. In the videos being edited category, you can vote for the one that you want me to publish next, and in the future video category, you can vote for the one that you want me to film next. Also, if you're feeling generous, please donate to my Patreon account, because with a bigger budget per video, I can do more things. Also, instead of stockpiling videos, I've decided I'm going to publish them as soon as I edit them, so in the next month or so, there's going to be a lot of videos coming out. On my Patreon, I also added a milestone, and if we get to $250 per video, I'll commit to doing videos for at least six months.